Hello world, Health Programmer One here. Today I wanted to do a video about a project I've been working on, and uh, this is probably going to be the first of maybe a two or three part series. I'm not really sure. The project's not finished yet. But anyways, if you've followed my channel for a while, followed my projects for a while, you'll know that two of my interests are RGB lighting, um, and open RGB and keyboard visualizer and all of my RGB projects, and then also mobile Linux. So the PinePhone, uh, the PinePhone Pro, and even post-market OS with, I've been playing with on the OnePlus 6T. Um, so phones running Linux. And of course, OpenRGB is a project to get RGB devices running on Linux, as well as Windows and Mac OS. And so when I first got my Pine phone, one of the things that I was curious about was, could I run OpenRGB on it? There was no reason it couldn't. Uh, it's a Linux device. And sure enough, it installed and opened just fine. But the Pine phone doesn't have any RGB lights on it to control. And so I thought, you know, wouldn't it be a good idea to make some sort of RGB accessory for the Pine phone? And if you don't know about the Pine phone, it actually has a set of pogo pins on the inside of the back cover that you can use to create expansions. And so my first thought was, I'll make some kind of back cover with some kind of RGB, uh, like maybe a ring light or a logo or something. Uh, that would be cool, it could integrate with OpenRGB and would be, it would look pretty cool. Um, so about a year after I got the PinePhone, they announced the PinePhone Pro. And so I ended up getting one of those and have been playing with that and uh, have been daily driving these phones uh, on and off for a while. But they also announced the PinePhone keyboard case. So if you're not familiar with the keyboard case, it is actually an accessory for the Pine Phone and the Pine Phone Pro. Uh, both have that expansion connector on the back. And the keyboard case is a clamshell case that the phone can fit in, replaces the back cover, connects to those pogo pins, and it provides uh, a full, well not full, but um, actual physical keyboard. And this keyboard's pretty nice. You can um, kind of use it as a little mini laptop and it provides a battery for the phone. So that got me thinking whenever this came out, you know, that's the perfect idea for my RGB project was, you know, RGB lighting is almost best on a keyboard uh, because you can do fancy effects and patterns and stuff. And we do that with the OpenRGB effects plugin. Um, so I was like, you know, it would be really cool if you could add RGB lighting to the PinePhone keyboard. Uh, so that was the project idea. And I actually bought um, some components to try and implement this idea back when I first got this keyboard case in January of this year. But unfortunately, I ran into some issues with the keyboard. Uh, my first keyboard actually died on me. And then I spent a few months waiting, or a few weeks, I should say, waiting for its replacement to get here. Uh, and then the replacement showed up and it had some hardware issues as well that uh, I did some investigation on. And so anyways, it's working now, but my RGB idea kind of got put to the sidelines for a bit. And so in like a month ago, I decided to try and pick up and resume that project. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about in this video is uh, show off what I've done and where I'm at so far on making an RGB backlit pine phone keyboard that interfaces with OpenRGB. So my first thought was, okay, I want to put LEDs under each key on the pine phone keyboard's um, key layout. So I'd already taken the keyboard apart before um, because I had tried, I had actually successfully repaired my first one and then diagnosed some hardware issues on the replacement. So what I, 
I already had taken it apart, so I knew kind of the internal structure. And so my idea was to basically make a new circuit board that is basically the full size of key map and then has a, an addressable RGB LED under each key. And then that, that circuit board will have a microcontroller to drive the LEDs. And then it will connect to the existing circuit board that's already in the keyboard case, which is then connected to the phone. And that way the phone can, in addition to receiving key inputs, which it already does, will be able to then control the lighting. So this is my um, new keyboard, which I'm not going to take apart in this video. This is the first one. This is my original keyboard and is the one that I've been experimenting on and using for this RGB project. So I've actually already sort of taken it apart here, but basically to disassemble the keyboard, there's a little lip on the front corner here. You need to get a pry tool in there and kind of wedge it until the clips start to open up around this corner and then use some picks or screwdrivers or something to hold it open while you continue to go around the entire edge of the keyboard including all the way back to the back and then the two pieces will just separate. You don't need to take apart the top half where the phone goes for this project, only the bottom half. So here's one that's already taken apart. So I'll just lift the cover off and inside you'll see we have the battery and we have the PCB. And so this PCB, uh, we'll just go ahead and move this keyboard out of the way. This PCB um, has a microcontroller that controls, it reads the keyboard. And it also has a power supply chip which charges and discharges the battery through this USB port on the side and then through this cable which powers the phone from the battery. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start disassembling this. Now the battery is usually held down with tape. Uh, I've already taken the tape off. So we're going to disconnect the battery. We'll put that to the side. And then we have these screws, seven screws that hold in this PCB. So let's go ahead and take those out. And if I remember right, they're all the same size. When I put this back together to do this teardown, I did not look at which screw went where, so obviously I have been into this keyboard before. Um, this circuit board's kind of hacked up with the repair I did. Needed to replace a regulator and also did a mod on the power supply board that I've since undone that mod, so there's a little jumper wire. But anyways, this PCB comes out. There's a data cable here. This is the I squared C interface that uh, communicates with the phone. And then up here is the power connection, which provides power from the keyboard battery to the phone. And then finally, this swings out and you can release this latch and take out this ribbon and the ribbon goes to the key matrix underneath the membrane. So that is how you disassemble the keyboard. So the next step in the process was I wanted to figure out what size my circuit board needed to be. So the idea is now that it's opened up and we've removed the stuff that's in the way, you can see each key has a little X-shaped hole in the plastic where the stem of the keycap goes into the base plate. So looking at this, I thought, well, the best thing to do to RGB this keyboard is put an LED 
uh, over each one of these holes to shine through. But the keycaps are made of black plastic. They're not transparent. So the keycaps will also have to be replaced. So that basically led this into a two-step project. The first step is make a circuit board with LEDs that goes on the back here. And so one LED over each one of these holes communicates through I squared C, gets powered from the phone, and still is slim and fit enough that it can just drop in here and then the other parts can go back on top of the PCB and kind of sandwich it in there. So that's challenge number one. And then challenge number two is we need to take all the keycaps out and replace them with transparent keycaps. So this is that the first part we're going to make a PCB and then the second part we're going to 3D print custom keycaps. So those are the two challenges for this project. So the first challenge I was like we'll deal with the keycaps later. Uh, let's just get RGB lights in the um, keyboard first. So I started with a piece of just cardboard and I put the piece of cardboard over the area here and I basically just started drawing little lines and where everything needed to be cut out. So there's these little plastic um, little tabs here and originally those are to uh, kind of hold the battery in place. Um, so there's tabs here, 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 here that I needed to work around and then there's the little standoffs for the seven screws. So I basically just started working this little piece of cardboard. I kind of pushed, pushed it down to put holes in it where the standoffs were and then I just cut it out with scissors um, where these tabs were, trimmed it down to size, and then I opened it up this way and um, just ignore that there are already keycaps on. These are um, the 3D printed ones that I've been working on. And this was an attempt at heat sinking. It didn't work too well. But anyways, what I did was I took a little pin. So not actually a screwdriver, but something finer. I think it was a little SIM eject tool. And I went through and held the cardboard up underneath from behind. And then I just poked a hole through each one of these. And what that did was it produced all these little holes through the cardboard. And then I removed the cardboard, flipped it over, and I was able to mark the location of each keyhole with a little plus sign. And so this served as my original template. So I used this to go ahead and do a PCB design and I created that using KiCad. So we'll look at that next. Uh, and so I had to do a schematic and then start making a PCB based on this template I made. So I'm going to show you what I did in KiCad. So it's on the screen behind me. And so uh, I've actually uploaded all my project files to uh, GitLab. But this is the KiCad project for the Pinephone keyboard PCB that I made. So we start out with the schematic, and I'll open that here. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so we started out with the schematic, and the schematic is just defining kind of all the components and how they're connected. Uh, doesn't define the actual layout. So basically the keyboard has 54 keys um, starting at the top and going all the way down to the bottom row. In total there are 54 different keys on the Pinephone keyboard. So what I've done is created 54 LEDs and that's what these are. Uh, so it's basically just 
um, power and ground going to all 54 LEDs. And then because these are addressable LEDs, that means data comes in and then it passes the data on to the next one and you form a chain of these LEDs. So on the left, we have our microcontroller, which is an Atmega 168P. Uh, I chose this part because I already had some of them laying around. Um, and it's the chip that's, it's actually not exactly the same chip that's on the Arduino Nano, but it's very similar to the one that's on and compatible with the one that's on the Nano. And I had already prototyped um, the software using just a regular ARGB strip and an Arduino Nano. So this was the perfect chip for um, this job. And then I added in a connector, which is, this connector is basically just some pads that will go on the back of a PCB. The idea of these pads is you can solder a wire onto them and then jump it over to the pads on the back of the PinePhone keyboard PCB. So they actually have these pads already on the PCB that you can solder to. And so I was just going to jumper these over to my new PCB. Uh, that's what these are. And because this is an I squared C interface, we need our SCL or serial clock and SDA serial data lines. So we have ground, we have VCC, which is five volts. And from the Pine phone, that's going to be the one labeled VBAT. Uh, VBAT is power coming out of the phone. Uh, it powers the keyboard PCB and then it'll also power my LED PCB. So that's our power supply. And then SD, SCL and SDA is our I squared C data. And then I also just went ahead and put uh, TX and RX, the transmit and receive serial port lines from the microcontroller, just in case I wanted to use an Arduino bootloader to load code to it um, in development. So I added that, and then I added a crystal oscillator, which I've actually gone unused in my current revision. I'm just using the onboard oscillator, but I put it there as an option. Uh, I actually ordered some, but they didn't show up in time. And it turns out it works fine on the internal oscillator. And then this is the AVR ISP six pin programming header. Uh, that's how I load code onto the board uh, using an AVR programming adapter. And so that's basically the control side of the board, uh, or the schematic, I should say. And then we have down here PD3 on the microcontroller, which is pin one, is the ARGB data stream that goes to the LEDs. So following this line upwards, uh, goes up and into D in on the first RGB LED. And from there on, we're just forming a chain. D out connects to D in, D out to D in, D out to D in. And it goes all the way, the same pattern, all the way down to LED 54, where we have data coming in and then D out's just not connected. So it's a pretty basic schematic. It's just an ARGB controller with a string of ARGB LEDs in a circuit board. Nothing too fancy, controlled by I squared C. Uh, so the real, the complicated part now is actually laying out the board to match what I came up with on the template. So the next thing is the PCB itself. So let's open that up and okay. So this is the complete circuit board. Uh, so I started this process by measuring the template using some calipers um, to get dimensions uh, X, Y, and then figure out these notches and figure out the screw holes and then this little uh, T-shaped cutout at the top here. Uh, so I went through several revisions of the just physical dimensions and trying to get these uh, cutouts for the 
through um, standoffs, uh, the holes in the board here for the standoffs to make it fit reliably. So what I ended up actually doing is I just printed the circuit board out on uh, my regular printer on paper and then I cut out the notches, basically just cut around the edge lines of the board. So um, cut all that out and then I just test fit. So I take the keyboard and I would install the piece of paper and I'd look at it and then I'd verify uh, this at least got me to verify the actual dimensions and the cutouts for the standoffs and the screw holes uh, so I was able to get the overall outline of the board pretty quickly using this method uh, obviously I had to go through um, several different revisions and print them out, cut them out, and I threw a bunch of them away, so I didn't hold on to all of them. But that was kind of an iterative process. And then what I would do is to make sure that the LEDs actually lined up with the holes. So I did print out the footprints for the LEDs themselves on the template. So I dropped that in, and then what you can do is hold this up to a light source. I have the TV uh, kind of dim right now for the purpose of being able to film it, but basically you hold it up to a bright light source. I use the, the light on my phone for like the flash and you could hold it up from behind and then look through it this way and you can see the LED footprints through the holes by shining the light through the paper. And so I had to do a few different revisions of that to basically nudge the LEDs a little bit this way, a little bit that way to get them lined up so that when I put this in and look through each hole in the board with the paper, I could clearly see that we're looking dead center on each LED footprint. So once I had all that done, um, I cleaned up the board, I added some um, well, I added all the like position microcontroller and the pads and one of the other things that I did was uh, one of these yeah I printed the back side on this one so that it, the back side faces up and this one I used to gauge where the connector should be so we'll put that in there there's wires under there so this one I use to gauge where I should put the connector that you'll solder the wires to and jump to this other board so this board is going to sit in like that and then this is the existing board it's going to go on top of it here and if I can get all the wires out of the way then it'll go there and then this should be soldered a jumper cable that goes down to this. So I wanted these two connectors to sort of be right on top of each other so that that would be an easy process. So after I finished designing the PCB, I went and I looked at it in the 3D viewer on KiCad, which just lets you look at a 3D rendering of your PCB. Um, and I made sure everything looked good and so everything looked good in the rendering so at that point it was time to get the boards manufactured and so this is the first time i've actually had boards professionally manufactured so i wasn't really super familiar with the process but it was really easy i went to pcb way uh, just because that's the name i've heard before and it seemed like they had good prices and i just exported my gerber files from KiCad, uploaded them to pcb way chose my options. The only thing I really needed to do was pick a thin circuit board. I think what I went with a, I think it was a 0.6 millimeter thickness uh, because I didn't want a thick PCB. We, we don't have a lot of room to work with inside the PCB or the pine phone case. And we're trying to sandwich two boards together. And then the LEDs themselves are gonna add some height. So I picked a thin PCB 
And then it was just a matter of paying for the boards and waiting for them to get here. And all in all, I think I paid around $30, and that was for five boards shipped. Um, so week, you know, two and a half weeks later or so, the boards showed up, and I got five of them. So here's one of the boards, and it came out really nicely. The boards are very clean. Uh, they have solder mask and... Um, yeah, all the pads are nice and double-sided and I mean this was new for me because this is the first time I've had a professionally made board and these are so nice to work with. So after getting the PCB, the first thing I did was just to test fit it into the Pinephone keyboard just to make sure that all of my holes and dimensions and everything line up. And so as it turns out, it fits pretty much perfectly. There's very little, there's a little bit of play, but not too much. And my goal was to add some double stick tape in between the LEDs um, and stick it down that way. Uh, that's basically how the battery was originally installed with some double stick tape. And then the battery will stick to the back of the PCB. And so together it would go together with something like this. That'll go there, and then the battery will go here, and it'll all go back together. So that's the, that's the goal. Uh, so the next step was to solder LEDs onto the board. And I don't have any video of that process. I'm just going to go ahead and move these out of the way. But I'll probably post some pictures of the process on screen for you now of placing the LEDs. Uh, what, it, what I did was, these are kind of the first time I've worked with uh, surface mount parts this small, but it was very easy. I ended up getting some solder paste, and I don't have a stencil, so I just kind of squirted some solder paste, put the LED in there, and then hit the four corners with the iron. That actually worked pretty well, and so I was able to solder in all the LEDs, and then the microcontroller, and... I put the ISP pin header in there to load code and then I desoldered it. And so um, so I'm gonna go get the completed board. And so this is the completed board. Uh, I've got some double stick tape on here or just some tape that I was using to hold it in place for testing. Um, but basically, yeah, I've soldered on the microcontroller. Uh, was having some issues with capacitance. Uh, the, the bottom row LEDs were flickering. So I ended up repurposing the ISP header after it's been programmed to hold a small capacitor between um, BCC and ground. Uh, I want to fix that on a future version of the PCB. And then I soldered on all 54 of these LEDs. These are WS2812B, uh, I think they're 2020 package. They're very tiny uh, ARGB LEDs. And then I soldered on my wires here to um, ground, I think it's ground VCC S, well, it's the same order that these are, yeah, ground VCC SCL and SDA. And so the, these wires will get soldered onto this. And then I'm going to put that down here with some tape. So that will hold on there. And then we can go ahead and I'll go ahead and connect this ribbon. And then what I notice is there are some issues with this board stack. So what I failed to realize is this switch and this USB port stick out quite a ways from this PCB. And so they actually hit into my PCB whenever this board goes in. Um, so this board doesn't actually sit in place because these the switch and the USB port are touching. The other issue I found is that this cable 
the data cable from the phone plugs in right under this pad. So this is going to be in the way, um, so where you solder the wires to my board, it basically right on top of, uh, if I can line this up, right on top of that, and that's not ideal. So I think in a future revision of the board, I need to move this connector probably over here somewhere, because that we're still competing with the battery. So ideally it would be like right in between the battery and also not run into the battery connector, which is somewhere like there. So maybe like in the middle here. And then put a cutout here for the USB port and here for the switch. And the only problem I can see is that I think under the USB port is actually an LED on the other side of this board. So that's going to be the hardest part to fix is trying to cut out enough space for the USB port but still getting light under that keycap. But for now, uh, let's just ignore that the boards don't stack up just right. I'm going to go ahead and plug this board back in. And then I will get these soldered on to those. I'll just go ahead and solder those on off camera. And then we can plug the phone in and see what it can do. So I've gone ahead and soldered them together. It's not the greatest soldering job. I didn't have my full station or flux or anything out right now. So I just tacked those back on and I've just gone ahead and taped the board in so that the board's flush against the back. Ideally, um, the battery will actually provide pressure on this to hold it together, but as the boards don't completely line up with this revision, uh, they kind of have to be held in with a little bit of tape. So that, and also I'm using way too long a cable. Um, this is just for testing. Um, but we'll we'll just do this as a little experiment. Let's stick some tape there. And maybe we'll have to stick a little bit extra tape there. And then Yeah, something like that. So let's go ahead and plug this in. So that goes in like that. And then maybe. Well, it's not ideal, it's not perfect, but for the purposes of testing, that uh, should be okay. So, there. So it's not gonna sit completely flat, but functionally complete. We have the RGB wired up, it's in place, the LED should be under the keys. This board is sort of held in, I've put in two screws and they're not all the way in, just so that it's kind of in place, but it's not lining up. These are still touching each other. It's having problems. I've got my wires lined up, so the data connection's hooked up. So now we can go ahead and set that something like that, and we can get the pine phone. So let's go ahead and remove the case. And then we'll go ahead and just install the pine phone. And the pine phone's already powering on. That's because the battery is installed in the keyboard case, and the battery is now powering the pine phone. And so I have my um, I have a few keycaps installed already. These, as I said, are my prototypes of the 3D printed design that I'm working on. Um, I think I'll save the 3D printing for uh, part two of this video, but that's definitely another part of this project that I'm still working on is the 3D printed keycaps. Um, so this is a work in progress. I'm, I'm still working on trying to get those improved. Uh, for this project, I ended up going out and buying a 
resin printer because I just couldn't make it happen on my Ender 3 Pro the way I wanted them to. So these are resin printed. So okay, so the Pine Phone is booted up. So I'm going to take it off the camera here and log in. And then, okay, uh, I'll just make sure that you can see that in the frame. And let's put something behind it to prop it up because with the bottom case not fully on, it's a little wobbly. So we'll do that. Hopefully that will hold it in place. Is it in the frame? Not quite. There we go. And then I'm going to go ahead and dim the lights a little bit. Okay, so we've got the Pine Phone running, and now all we need to do is run OpenRGB. Now, this is a custom build of OpenRGB that I've added a protocol called Basic I squared C to the serial port, and Basically, this is the protocol I implemented in Arduino Sketch, which is the code that's running on the microcontroller. And because it's basically just treated as an LED strip, I've created a visual map with the visual map plugin. So we're going to go ahead and load the visual map here. And so this visual map um, basically organizes the keys into a grid. Um, let's go ahead and make that full screen. So yeah, so organize the keys into a grid. Now we can go back to devices and toggle LED view so you can see what that looks like. So we have our keys and now the, the one thing is, so I can go ahead and say click on red and we have a red keyboard. So the controller is working nicely uh, but one thing is is I measured the power draw um, and actually to get the most power draw you'd want to use white and so as you can see that's really bright uh, with all of those LEDs on thing is that keyboard is now drawing about like probably around an amp I, I didn't do a super scientific measurement but I did look at the readings from sensors on the power consumption before and after turning on the white LEDs, and it went up very significantly. And using this long term is bad because the pogo pins on the Pine Phone are only really rated for around 500 milliamps. So right now we are pulling too much power from the Pine Phone. So luckily with the, the um, visual map, it's kind of hard to use with just a touch screen. So I'm gonna open up actually. We can just use the keys here. Um, so we can turn the brightness down with the visual map plugin. And we can still get quite a bit of brightness, even with the brightness turned below 50%. And that's cutting the power consumption pretty greatly. So running this at around half brightness is probably ideal. But now it's basically just a keyboard that's in OpenRGB. And we can do kind of whatever we want. So the effect that I'm quite fond of in OpenRGB is, is this bubbles effect. And uh, if I can turn it on, there you go. It's OpenRGB's effect running on a Pine Phone keyboard. And, and you can see it's matching it's pretty much exactly what OpenRGB is doing on the screen. And so, yeah, it's a phone with an RGB keyboard and that's pretty cool. I'm really happy with how it turned out and it'll look better once I get all the keycaps installed. So these keycaps, um, it's what I'm trying to do is make uh, print the top of the keycap in black resin which is slightly transparent because it's so thin and then print the stem using clear resin to get a nice um, shine through of the LEDs and so far I think it's working pretty well. I still have some tweaks I want to do to the process but yeah um, well, we can also do some other cool stuff so let's do the uh, audio visualizer here 
So this is a port of keyboard visualizer and we should be able to listen to the microphone. Well, it says built-in microphone. Maybe we'll have to turn the amplitude up. Testing, one, two, three. Yep, there we go. So, okay, that's a lot. Uh, let's go with like 5,000. A little hard to do without um, actual keycaps. And then we'll back the brightness, the background brightness down so you can kind of see it's how it's responding to my voice. And so, yeah, you can, uh, because this is a Pine phone and it's running Linux and a Pulse Audio or Pipewire stack, you will have access to your uh, monitor of uh, audio output on here. So, like, you can have this uh, responding to your music that you're playing on the Pine phone uh, through whatever audio device you're listening to. So, it's basically just open RGB as it would run on any other computer, but it's on a phone with a phone keyboard. It's pretty cool. I, I'm really happy with how this turned out. Uh, it's been a fun project, but I, I would like to uh, produce at least a small quantity of these. I know I've heard from at least a few people who are interested in buying them. I, I don't know if I want to make this a product that I'm actually going to like sell full time, but as a, as a small batch thing, yeah, I would be willing to send out a few of these if people are interested. Uh, I don't know how I'm gonna handle assembly or keycaps, but yeah. So anyways, uh, thanks for watching. Um, that's part one of the Pinephone Keyboard RGB project. And stay tuned for a part two on 3D printing. And then uh, there will be at least another part whenever I do get around to revising and getting updated PCBs to fix the issues with the USB port and the switch on the side and hopefully then I'll be actually be able to close up the keyboard with the bottom piece and have an actual unit that's fully assembled. So yeah, uh, thank you for watching.